two weeks ago, I mentioned in our Sunday morning message that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read how God created the first man. Scripture says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So at what point did Adam become a living being? When God formed him out of the dust of the earth? Yeah, absolutely. Adam became a living being after God had breathed the breath of life into him. What was that breath of life? What do you think? I heard it, his soul, right? What would we be without our soul? We wouldn't be alive. We need our soul to live. God breathed the breath of life into him. And here we see the parallel of God's church. During his earthly ministry, Jesus taught his listeners what he expected of his followers, who his people truly are, and how they behave and, and, and act. He often did this by comparing misinterpreted teachings of the Old Testament to his teachings of having a personal and an intimate relationship with God, and, and he showed how different that looks. At times, he used parables to illustrate the great value of his church and the great value of the truths on which God's church is built. Can we think of one parable that illustrates this, the value of the, of the truths of the church? It's about salvation and God's people. A little bit louder. Mustard seed, and that shows how uh, God's church grows, right? It's as small as a mustard seed, but it grows quickly. Yeah. What about the pearl of great price, right? The person who found the pearl of great price, he sold everything. He got rid of everything so that he could own this pearl. He saw its value. He saw its worth. And this is a, a display of giving ourselves completely over to God so that we can possess this truth as well about being uh, children of God and how we can become a child of God and, and belong to God's people. And before his departure back to heaven, Jesus reiterated the purpose and calling of his church, that his people were to go out into all nations and make disciples out of all people. And I encourage and uh, help remind brothers and sisters often that Jesus did not say, go into all the world and make Christians. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. What's the difference? Yeah, a disciple learns under the teacher, right? It's a continuous thing. It's not just this one-time thing. It's an experience to become a Christian, that's true. But what happens after that? It's, it's a life, long learning. Eh? We are to be disciples of the Lord, and we are to, to help disciple others. And that requires far more from us than just sharing the gospel. We are to make disciples of all nations. And with all of these things, do we see how when Jesus came to earth, how he was forming his church? with his own hands. But it was only after the church had been completely formed and then later purchased and cleansed through Christ's sacrifice that the breath of God could be received by his church. This is the picture of the first man. God formed him with his hands and then breathed the breath of life into him. So too with God's church. Jesus came to earth. He formed his church. And then when he left, he breathed the breath of life into it. The Holy Spirit. Pentecost is the birth or birthday of Christ's church. The question that we want to focus on this morning is, do we love God's church? Can we say this morning with all of our hearts, I love God's church? We often say, I love God. Sometimes we will say, I love 
our neighbor or my neighbor. But do we love God's church? Do we love God's church as much as God loves his church? What is our attitude and our level of affection towards his church? And to determine the answers to these questions and similar ones, we want to use Psalm 48 as our guide. Now, we briefly looked at some of the components of God's church as related to Christ's teachings and earthly ministry, but we now want to look at a few symbolic representations of God's church and of God's people as used in the Old Testament. And these representations are meant to give us a better understanding of what God's church is, how it works, what it looks like. Because can we love something that we don't or don't know what it is? Can we love something that we don't recognize? We can't, right? How can we love something that we don't know about? We need to know what God's church is. Let's begin with verse 1 of Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of of our God. So God's people are often referred to as the city of God. In verse 12, the city is given a name. What is that name? Zion, right? Zion is an interesting name, but have we ever wondered where that word came from? What it means? Zion. The first time scripture mentions the word Zion is in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Now, at this point in time in Israel history, David had already been reigning as king for eight years over Judah from Hebron. After eight years of civil war between the followers of David and the followers of Saul's family, King Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was murdered, which led to a truce between the two warring factions, Israel and Judah. And 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 3 then says, Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Now following this event, David set his heart on, on making a new capital for the united kingdom that was just created. He wanted a new capital, and God had shown him exactly where that new capital would be, because just in the next verses, verses 6 and 7, this is what the Bible says, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. This is the first time the word Zion is used in Scripture. He took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Jerusalem, or Zion, as referred to here, would become the great capital city of God's united people. As Bible readers, we know that David had a very close relationship with God right from the days of his youth. Even as a young shepherd boy, David trusted in God to defeat various enemies. Like what? What were some of his first enemies that he defeated? I wonder if anyone will get this question right. Oh, very good. All three answers. The lion and the bear, and then Goliath. Very good. And because God had delivered a lion and a bear into his hands as a young shepherd boy, he was not afraid to stand up to the giant Goliath. He had such a close relationship with God. He didn't just defeat these enemies and say, look what I did with my might. This was a little shepherd boy who trusted in the Almighty God. And God delivered. He had such a close relationship with God. And even though Scripture tells us that Samuel was the spiritual leader of God's people during that time, especially during the early years of David's life, we often read how David spoke to God directly, as though he were a priest. And sometimes he would even take the ephah, a, a religious symbol, and, and have communion with God himself. Even though there was a high priest during that time. He would speak to God himself. And I'm certain that God had instructed David to choose Jerusalem as 
the new capital of Israel. Jerusalem was not only to be the political capital of God's people, it was to be the new spiritual capital of his people as well. The place that God himself had chosen for his dwelling place, where his presence would reside. And Moses says to the people of God in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 10 to 11, But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be in the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heat offerings of your hand, and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. It's because David knew God's word, he knew these things, and because he was being led by God himself, that we already read in the next chapter of 2 Samuel that David brought the ark of God to Jerusalem. He knew David knew the only way that Jerusalem or Zion could be the city of God was for God's presence to be there. In 2 Samuel 7, we read then how after the ark had been brought to Jerusalem, after his palace had been created, then he says to the prophet Nathan in verse 2, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, But the ark of God dwells inside ten curtains. It wasn't good enough for him that that God's presence or the ark of the covenant, that that it had to be in ten curtains while he as a king dwelt in a palace. He knew God was his king. Why would the king of kings not get a temple, a palace for himself? And he found the perfect place to build the temple, Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. And I'd like to give you some homework this morning. Why is Mount Moriah so important? Don't tell me if you know the answer now. This week, if we have time, do a quick internet search. Why is Mount Moriah so important? And see what comes up. Okay? Very good. Mount Moriah, that's where the city or the temple should be within the city. Now, some scholars state that the city of Zion is referred to as such because it was built on Mount Zion. So Mount Moriah is one of the hills on top of the greater Mount Zion, okay? And that mountain was called Zion, and so some scholars say perhaps the city of Zion is called that because it was built on Mount Zion. And we see this picture of a mountain used in our opening text from Psalm 48. Listen to how God's abiding presence is described as dwelling in this mountainous city. Let me read verses 1 to 3 for us. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. In his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. And I love this description of, uh, of Mount Zion being beautiful in elevation. Now, in our minds, these uh, words create a picture of God's city being lifted up as being something special that you can see from afar. Now, why might, we, or why might the psalmist ex- describe Mount Zion as beautiful in elevation? What does that depict? What do we think? Elevation, what is that a picture of? Very tall, being high, lifted up. Who is lifted up above all? Jesus, God, right? God is beautiful in elevation. And what is beautiful to God? What does scripture say? Holiness. God is holy, beautiful in holiness. It could signify the beautiful holiness of our great God and his people. Secondly, it reflects the supremacy 
of God's reign and how his kingdom is above every kingdom. He is king of kings and lord of lords and he dwells in his temple, in his city, on his mountain. It is lifted up in supremacy. And we see both of these thoughts presented in Psalm 96, verse 9. Oh, how, oh worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. A beautiful mountain, because God is there. Psalm 48 describes God's people as a great city with a dwelling place of God in it, built on a mountain, overtowering the rest. Now we can imagine how descriptions like these would have caused great pride among the Jewish people toward their temple and toward their beloved city. And it's true, the temple in Jerusalem was seen as important even in the eyes of God, this physical building. Throughout the Old Testament, we read how God often rebuked the Jewish people for defiling the temple, which had been ordained to God. It was the place that carried God's name. And even Jesus became upset in the New Testament. Why did he become upset? When he saw the temple. Because they had turned it into a marketplace. Especially the outer courts and so forth. Scripture says, Matthew 21, 12 to 13, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be a house, or called a house of prayer. Other places it says, A house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of thieves. The physical temple of God had been ordained to be a place where God's presence would be invited to, to abide, a place where God's word and sacrifices were kept. And certainly we can see how Jesus desired his people to respect such a consecrated and holy place. It would be the same as this church building. This church building has been ordained for the worship of God. We call it God's house. And when we are in the sanctuary, we have a, a special reverence here. Because we know that we have ordained it to God. And yet we know that there is another temple. We know that Jesus had a strong desire for his followers to understand and see how the temple and the things of the law were mere shadows cast by the truths of him and his new covenant that he came to establish and to ratify. The true temple, the true city, the true mountain of God were and are his people. Psalm 48, which describes the beauty of Zion, resonates with our hearts today because we see God's New Testament people represented in these verses. What is God's temple today? Well, Paul writes to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows up into a temple, a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So those who have received and accepted, personally experienced the teachings of Christ and the apostles and the prophets are being built up alongside other children of God into this holy temple. We are but building blocks. Together we form the temple of God. God's people are God's temple. What is God's city? Today, all those whose sins have been washed away through the blood of the Lamb and whose names are written in the book of life. The Apostle John had the privilege while on the island Patmos to see the new Jerusalem descend from the clouds. This is what he says and describes in Revelation 21, verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Wait, how can a city be adorned like a bride? How are, to we, how are we to understand this? Was this a physical city? It was God's people. Adorned like a bride. His church. I love the beautiful description of Christ and his bride in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Paul writes to the husbands, and he takes the comparison of Jesus and his bride, and, and he tells husbands, this is how we ought to love and treat our wives. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Jesus has prepared his church. He came for his church. He died for his church. He's washed his church clean. All those who belong to his church belong to Christ's bride. This glorious city adorned like a bride for her husband. What is God's mountain today? Listen to how Micah describes the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Micah 4, 1-2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We find nearly the identical words in Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. God's people are described as the mountain of God, to which peoples from all nations will flow to. Why? Because who's there? Because God's there. God dwells on his holy mountain. They will flow to the teachings of Christ and through a new birth be added to the mountain of God, Mount Zion. Now there are some people who, who do not like it when Christians refer to God's people as Mount Zion. But loved ones, there were people already in the Old Testament who, who hated Mount Zion. We read about them in verses 4 through to 7. Psalm 48 for behold, the kings assembled, they passed by together, they saw it. And so they marveled, they were troubled, they hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman and, and birth pains, as when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. So why do the surrounding nations not like Mount Zion? They saw the presence and power of the Almighty God among his people. They saw how God protected and blessed his people. And they become greatly afraid. They become greatly uneasy. And it's still the same way today. When people look at children of God, they become uneasy. They see people that have peace in their heart, peace between themselves and God, peace between themselves and their fellow man. Who has that of this world? No one. They become uneasy because they see a people who are cautious about what they say, who show their love for others in very tangible ways. They see a people who have pure motives for whatever they do, a people they can trust, a people very different to this world. And yet, when God's people see these things, how God's presence is among them, how are they? Verse 8 says, As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord our host. In the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Loved ones, those who dwell on Mount Zion can attest to the presence and the power of God because they have personally experienced him and they continue to experience him in their everyday lives. 
Those that, the things that we have seen, loved ones, the things that we have heard, we can attest to, and we rejoice because we get to dwell with God on Mount Zion. Now, someone said to me, actually, more than one person in the recent past has said to me, you know, why is it that when they come to some of the churches of God that they don't see more smiles? It always seems so serious here when they attend. And I didn't, I don't really have a good answer for that. I would like to encourage us all to display the joy in our hearts more. Because if, if God has truly given us this infilling of joy, may it radiate from us so that others are drawn not to us, but to Christ. It's amazing how many people we can reach with a smile. And they're free. As long as, the last I checked, they were still free. And uh, they sure make a difference. Let's express the joy in our hearts, right? Especially when we come together in the place ordained to worshiping him. I'd like to encourage us to do, to do that. Now, some say that because, because we call ourselves the church of God, we claim to be the only right church. Some people say, well, why do you call yourselves the Church of God? The answer is simple. It's the only name that's used in the New Testament for God's church. So, like the Church of God in Ephesus, or the Church of God at Corinth, we call ourselves the Church of God in Seminole. We use the same name that's used in Scripture. It's, a, it's an easy answer. But just because we use the name Church of God, does that automatically make us a part of God's church? No, it doesn't. And there's a great warning in that, brothers and sisters. To become part of God's church, each and every one of us needs to be born again, right? Each and every one of us has to experience this citizenship into God's city, each and every one of us needs to have God cleanse our heart, have his dwelling presence in us. We need to be part of his temple. We need to be part of his mountain. And then we are God's church. Loved ones, God only has one church. There's only one Mount Zion. There's only one temple. There is only one city. And whoever is born again today belongs to the temple city and mountain of God. Salvation makes you a member. Salvation makes you a member. Before we close, I want us to reflect on our own hearts and to ask yourselves the question, do I love God's church? The psalmist, when he considered all of these things, wrote in Psalm 48, We have thought, O God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple, according to your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Let Mount Zion rejoice. You know, this rejoicing comes from a deep love for God, knowing that God is in our midst, that we belong to God's people. He wants us to love his church. In order to love his church, loved ones, we first need to know what his church is. And God wants us to study his church. He wants us to study his word and get a better understanding of what his church is, how it functions, how it grows, and how interdependent God's church is. The psalmist describes this in a word picture. He says, Walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces. In other words, study God's word and, and see what it says about the church. Examine it from every side so that you learn what it is. Because how are we ever to tell our children 
and our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, what God's church is if we don't know what it looks like ourselves. Examine it from every side. The more we learn about God's church, the greater our love for God's church will be. There are some who profess to, to love Jesus and his gospel, but they have very little love for his church. They say, I don't need churches. I will serve God myself. Could we imagine a temple built of one rock? Doesn't do much. We need each other. We are interconnected. We are the building blocks of Christ, and together we form God's church. And the psalmist concludes by reminding us of another very important reason for knowing what the church of God is, that you may tell, that you may tell it to the generation following. Do our kids, our grandkids, our nieces and nephews know what God's church is? And if not, who's to blame? It's surely not they, right? It's us. It's us. On Wednesday, I believe it was on Wednesday, in our prayer meeting, we heard that a hundred years after Nineveh was saved through the preaching of Jonah and through the grace of God, a hundred years, destruction came over the whole city because they had forgotten the God who had saved them. A hundred years is approximately three generations. What will our families look like in three generations? Will they still have the same love for God and the things of God? Will they know what the church is? The responsibility, loved ones, falls on us today to share this knowledge of, of Jesus and his church with our future generations. May God bless us so that in a hundred years from today, the church in Seminole could reflect on his amazing grace and help throughout all these years. What is God's church? Do we love God's church? Do we belong to his church? Do we know what his church is? May God help us to reflect on these questions. The future of his church depends on it. No, better said, the future of us belonging to his church depends on it. Amen.